Within the lecture series on the Arab uprisings, the VIDC has analyzed the uprisings from different perspectives these last years. Last time, in spring, we had a discussion on jihadi movements by focusing on Sunni Islam. Tonight, we will widen our perspective towards Shia Islam, and we will critically look on the split between Sunnah and Shia, since currently the wars and conflicts in the Arab world are more and more analyzed along religious lines, especially since the rise of the Islamic State, or Daesh, as the Islamic State is called in the Arab world. Commentators of the situation, as well as actors involved in the different conflicts, explain the conflicts of the fight between Sunnis and Shiites, or between Saudi Arabia and Iran, or between secular and religious movements. However, the conflict lines are not yet so clear. It is a simplifying way to explain the situation in the Middle East without reflecting European and American domination within the res uh, region within the last decades, even centuries. Professor Dabashi will therefore not only put the split between Sunnah and Shia into a historical context, but will present us an alternative interpretation of the conflicts from a post-colonial perspective. Before I give the floor to the podium, I, let me briefly introduce to you our chair of tonight, Dr. Helmut Krieger. He is a consultant to the VIDC and a social scientist and researcher at the Department of, Inter of Development Studies at the University of Vienna. His main research areas are the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, movements of political Islam in the Arab world, critical state series, and post-colonial theory. His most recent publication is Umkämpfte Staatlichkeit Palästina zwischen Besatzung, Entwicklung und politischem Islam, which, by the way, will be presented on November 18th in the Center for International Development, C3, here in Vienna. Last but not least, some uh, administrative remarks you find on your chair, the feedback sheets for your comments and critiques. Please fill them out and drop them outside in the blue box. I wish us all now an interesting uh, evening and many uh, thought-provoking ideas today. And I'll give you now the floor, Helmut. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming here. It's my distinct pleasure to chair this lecture on uh, the construction of an antagonism between Sunnis and Shiites. And we are for sure very pleased to welcome Professor Hamid Abashi. It's really absolutely great that you could come to Vienna despite the more than busy schedule you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I will introduce Hamid Abashi in a few uh, seconds. First of all, let me uh, go back to what Magda already mentioned. The subject of tonight's event <laughs> is, on the one hand, a critical analysis on um, the perspective that conflicts and wars in the Arab world can or should be explained along religious or ethnic lines. That means nowadays it's quite common, more than common sometimes, when talking or writing about the Arab world, uh, about conflicts, about wars in the Arab world, to refer to sectarian dimensions perceived as driving forces of uh, political conflict. From that perspective, conflict and war are implicitly or explicitly um, naturalized. In order to critically analyze such identity constructions, Hamid Abashi will go deeper into Muslim history and will argue, to put it very, very short, will argue uh, that sectarianism is entirely a byproduct of colonialism. On uh, the other hand, uh, Hamid will conclude his lecture with a critical outlook on the issue of refugees fleeing from war, fleeing from the conflicts in the Arab world to Europe. Hence, uh, we have already 
raised different main questions for tonight's event. First, in what way can sectarianism in the Arab world be linked, in what way can sectarianism be linked to uh, the issue of colonialism and today's imperial interventions in the Arab world? Generally, how did that come about and why could sectarianism or sectarian movements or movements that are really based, ideologically based on uh, sectarian divisions, how could those movements gain such an important role in the Arab world? On the other hand, with regard to uh, today's refugees uh, movements, in what way can the arrival of refugees in Europe be understood as a return of uh, a European repressed? And last but not least, I think uh, uh, the main issue then is how are these two phenomena, on the one hand the issue of sectarianism, sectarian movements, colonialism, imperialism, and on the other hand, uh, the issue of today's refugee movements coming to fleeing from the Arab world and coming to Europe, how are these two phenomena linked together? Yes, I think these are the main questions for tonight's uh, event, and I hope we can answer them despite their complexity and the more than limited timeline we have. Before we are starting, let me briefly introduce Professor Hamid Abashi. Hamid Abashi was born in the southwestern western city of Ahwaz in Iran. He received his early education in his hometown and his college education in Tehran before he moved to the United States in the 1970s where he received a dual PhD uh, in Sociology of Culture and Islamic Studies from the University of Pennsylvania in 1984, followed then by a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. He wrote, and I think that's a quite interesting point, that you wrote uh, uh, your doctoral dissertation on Max Weber's uh, uh, theory of charismatic authority, and maybe it can be seen then in some of your uh, publications after that. Yes, Hamid is uh, the Hagop Kevorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University in New York. He, uh, I think this is the oldest and most prestigious the chair. No, yes, indeed, the chair is old and a quite prestigious one in the United uh, States. Uh, he has taught and delivered lectures in many North and Latin American, European, Arab and Iranian universities. Furthermore, he is a founding member of the Institute for Comparative Literature and society, as well as a founding member of the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. Hamid has also served as a jury member uh, on many international art and film festivals, for example, the Locarno uh, Film Festival, uh, International Film Festival in Switzerland. And in this context of his commitment to advancing transnational uh, art and independent, let's call it independent world cinema, he is the founder of Dreams of a Nation, a Palestinian film project. I mean, he's written 25 books, <laughs> edited four, and contributed chapters to many more. He is also the author of over 100 essays, articles, and book reviews, really unbelievable, uh, book reviews in major scholarly and peer reviewed journals and uh, on subjects ranging from Iranian studies, medieval and modern Islam, Islamism, feminism, empire, the whole issue of a globalized empire ideologies and strategies of resistance, 
visual and performing arts to uh, uh, comparative literature and the philosophy of art. Uh, his books and articles have been translated into numerous languages, including, I think, Japanese, uh, German for sure, Spanish, French, uh, Arabic for sure, also Persian, clearly, Hebrew, Turkish, Urdu, and so on and so forth. So hence, uh, um, among all these numerous, uh, or better to say, more or less countless publications, I will name just a few books published in the last years or so. Post-Orientalism, Knowledge and Power in Time of Terror, published in 2008. Shiism, A Religion of Protest, published in 2011. The Arab Spring, The End of Post-Colonialism, published in 2012. Being a Muslim in the World, published in 2013. And one of his last publications, Can Non-Europeans Think, published in 2015. I mean, we, we had a quite wonderful uh, conversation about this book, and therefore I, I think I should add uh, the title of Hamid's introduction chapter, which is, Can Europeans Read? <laughs> Last but not least, some words uh, about the format of uh, our event. Hamid will speak for about 45 minutes, we'll see. And after that, I will open the floor to questions and comments. So, please, let's begin our session and... Welcome, Hamid Abashi. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Uh, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. And that concludes my daring to talk German to this uh, audience. And that has nothing to do with me but the fact that the competition between German and English early in American history, German lost, English won. And thus, I am the product of English as an American imperial language. Uh, I'm utterly beyond words delighted to be in the company of you here. This is my second trip to Vienna, your magnificent city, uh, in the great shadow of Bruno Kreisky, uh, your visionary socialist leader with uh, whose uh, courageous and imaginative uh, politics my generation of uh, socialists were born and, and raised. Uh, Nehru, Yamal Abdel Nasser, Mohammed Mossadegh, all of that generation were contemporaneous and uh, as a result for me is a distinct pleasure to be uh, talking to you in the shadow of, uh, of uh, Bruno Kreisky. The other point I want to make is uh, that I was warned that both the Saudi delegation and Iranian delegation are here. And I, I understand that many of you are students of diplomacy. So this is my test to deliver a talk that neither the Iranian nor the Saudi ambassador delegation will get angry or get into a fight I, and I intend to do it by turning their attention to me so I promise by the end of my talk they will be more in disagreement with me than with each other uh, I have been asked to talk about uh, the, uh, the Sunni Shi'i hostility to make to cut to the chase make a longer story short so you know where I'm, I'm headed there is absolutely no fundamental difference between the Sunnis and Shi'is. Sunnis and Shi'is, uh, there are 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. The overwhelming majority of them are Sunni. And there's also a small minority of Shi'is. They believe in the same Quran, the same number of 114 chapters of the Quran. They believe in the same God, in the same Prophet. They believe in the same, the sanctity of what the Prophet said, the Hadith collection. Uh, there are minor variations with among the Sunnis and Shi'is so far as the interpretation of certain chapters of the Quran is concerned. 
For the Shi'is, there is a particular significance of the family of the Prophet, uh, uh, his daughter Fatima in particular, his son-in-law and cousin Ali in particular, and their two children. It doesn't mean that for the Sunnis, these, uh, the, the Prophet's family are not important or are not significant, they're equally important, but eventually for the Shi'is, in the course of history, the Prophet's family assumed a particularly sacrosanct significance. Now, uh, my talk will have three sections. The first section is beginning to talk about the Arab and Islamic world today, right now. Okay? Today, what happened? Syria is the epicenter of a battle between the United States and its regional and European allies on one side, and Russia and its uh, regional allies, particularly Iran and uh, Hezbollah, on the other side. What are they doing? They're bombing Syria. 26 million population of Syria, 14 million of them have been displaced, uh, most of them within their own country, and then a 2 million population has left for Lebanon, another 2 million for uh, Turkey, and more than a million uh, into Jordan. And only a small fragment of it have found their ways towards Europe, and as you know better than I do, they have created a particular anxiety uh, in uh, European societies, particularly Austria here, your own country, and Germany, which is the, uh, the Kaaba, the Mecca, of where this, uh, this uh, population is headed. So I will first talk about these circumstances, today's circumstances in the Arab and Muslim world, and place the Sunni Shi uh, apparent conflict in this context, and in which I will argue that in fact there are no fundamental differences between the Sunni Shi'is so far as the actual people, their doctrines, their ideas, uh, etc., is concerned. Uh, and that it is really a manifestation of regional rivalries between Iran and Saudi Arabia for regional hegemony. So, uh, unfortunate accident, for example, that happened in, during the last Hajj pilgrimage, that there was a stampede and hundreds of uh, Muslims uh, uh, lost their lives, which is a very unfortunate thing that can happen anywhere. And more than any other people, I'm sure Saudi authorities are thinking for this not to happen again. Suddenly, it turns into a political football between uh, Riyadh and Tehran, blaming uh, uh, each other. Uh, my second move is for me to ask you to bear with me to cut to a period in, in uh, Islamic history that the current manufacturing of the sectarian differences didn't exist. And place, I will place for you Sunni and Shi'i variations within a larger spectrum of social and intellectual history. Not to say that no Sunnis and Shi'is did not exist, but existed in a different configuration. And understanding that particular configuration is a key for us to begin to creatively imagine an alternative geography and topography of emotions, convictions, and beliefs that have existed. My third move is to come back here to Vienna by way of suggesting that my cutting into medieval period, uh, because this is not an academic gathering, this is a public gathering, is not an exercise in futility, but in fact to encourage Europeans, in this case Austrians, to begin to reimagine an alternative conception of Europe, not the Europe that now we have as a fetishized entity, don't come near me, don't touch me, I'm European, you're non-European, uh, but in fact a Europe that is reimagined, rearticulated within its, Euro its Mediterranean civilizational context. So the reason that I go to the medieval period for projecting an alternative social intellectual history in which Sunnis and Shi'is have existed is not an exercise in academic futility, sort of what in New York we call, we say, Monday morning quarterbacking, but actually say alternative worlds have existed and can exist, and for better or for worse, whether you like it or you don't like it, the fact is that Europe as a continent 
is at the threshold of reimagining itself, reimagining its uh, uh, principles and values and, and so forth, not just because of the event that happened in Syria and now there is a migration exodus of Syrians, Iraqis, Afghans, Eritreans, but because of a more fundamental and more enduring, more structural changes that have happened over the last two or three centuries that creates a massive labor migration. So let me first uh, uh, begin by uh, uh, offering a number of dates. You see, dates are very important as to when do you start the narrative. Do you start narrative today, 9 o'clock in the morning, when you got up in the morning and you read the news and you saw that the Russians crossed over the Turkish airspace and the NATO had a meeting telling, wagging its finger at the Russia, don't cross the uh, thing. Uh, and then the uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, Navy from the, uh, from the uh, uh, Caspian Sea shooting its, uh, its missiles. And I remember when I was watching it, I said, oh my God, where is it going? And sort of, I'm curious about the map of Iran. Oh, that's Rasht. Oh, that's Azerbaijan. You know, I hope it don't fall now. Uh, and then the propaganda war begins. The Americans say, oh, they fell in over Iran. Putin says, no way, or we have superior uh, intelligence, military, etc., and so forth. Do we start 9 o'clock in the morning news? Or do we start from the time of Prophet Muhammad, and Mecca, and Medina, and, uh, and all of that? No, we start with playing with dates. A number of crucial dates we have that I propose to you are critical for us to think. Why are they critical? Because they are critical by virtue of massive social movements that they have generated. The first significant date that I propose is the year 2011. Why 2011 is important? It is the beginning of the Arab revolutions, January. And these Arab revolutions had absolutely no sectarian color began in Tunisia, continued with Egypt, suddenly people in Bahrain were up in uh, protest, Yemenis were in protest, uh, Tawakkul Karaman from Yemen was given the Nobel Prize because of her role in the, in the Yemeni uprisings, and so forth and so on. What was the slogan, the chief slogan of the Arab revolutions? We are Sunnis, you are Shi'is, it had anything to do with that? Absolutely not. The paramount slogan of the Arab revolutions, beginning in uh, Tunisia and ending in, uh, continuing with, uh, with Egypt, was a shab, you read, a squat and a People demand the overthrow of the regime. People demand the overthrow of the regime. There is no Sunni, there is no Shi'i. There is no down with the West, the death to America, nothing. It has to do with masses of millions of Arabs pouring into the streets. And immediately the event was known as Arab Spring. I wrote a book called Arab Spring. I began to look at Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Syria. Salme Salme. This was the slogan of the Syrian revolution which began. Peace, peace. That's all. This was the revolution. Now, the expression, people demand the overthrow of the regime, I have argued, this regime is not just Hosni Mubarak. This regime is not just Bashar al-Assad. This regime is not just Zin al-Abidin Ali or uh, anybody. This regime is also a regime of knowledge production. How do we read these revolutions? How do we understand them? The phrase Arab Spring, Arabi al-Arabi, that these revolutionaries themselves began to use, resonated very well, in fact, with the revolutions of 1848 in Europe that were also known as Springs of Nations, 1848. Why? Because they were transnational. It was not just uh, one country, but had catalytic effect in multiple countries. Now, that created an extraordinary moment for those of us who are interested in the social intellectual history of the region. I always say the Iranian revolution happened in 1978-89 uh, uh, when I was 25, 26, 
and I was excited about the Iranian Revolution. And then I was in my 60s that all the Arab world was up in, uh, so I was like a kid in a, in a, in a candy store. You didn't know which way to, to look. Look in Tunisia, look in Egypt, suddenly the uh, Yemen, the, the Bahrain, etc. The reason that two, 2001, now imagine, I mean you're old, you remember 2011. What was the image that coming out of the Arab world? You didn't hear of Sunni or Shia. The image that was coming out of the Arab world was Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square was the paramount picture of these revolutionary uprisings. What did we see in Tahrir Square? We saw Egyptians, men, women, if they considered themselves Islamists or if they considered themselves secular. If they veil, so-called veil, I don't believe in the concept of veil, this is a veil, okay? Uh, or they didn't uh, uh, veil. Uh, uh, pouring massively into the squares and streets, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Egypt, uh, Manama Square in, uh, in, bah in Bahrain, in Yemen, etc., demanding what? Another great uh, slogan of the Egyptian revolution was Hurriya, uh, right? Freedom. Adal Ishtimaiya, or Ishtimaiya, as the Egyptians say, uh, social justice. Uh, karama, integrity, dignity, well, Aish, bread. There was no Sunni Shi'i. There was no even Islamic. There was no West, East, North, South, nothing. It had to do with dignity, with social justice, with freedom. Who was participating in it? Women's rights organizations, labor unions, student assemblies. You had no idea if they are even Muslims, let alone Sunni or Shia. And uh, this, this was the picture. In fact, in some, when the Indignato movement began from Greece to, uh, to Spain, some squares in Europe began to rename themselves in honor of Tahrir Square as Tahrir Square. And when the Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street movement began in the United States, suddenly, the uh, Zuccotti Park in, in downtown New York was imagining itself in the image of Tahrir Square. Now, cut three years later, when you have this cutthroat Daesh business, it changed the landscape of the Arab world. What, when you now hear Arab world, what do you see? You see a black-clad uh, uh, murderer with a knife to somebody's throat uh, in the background of blue sky, sort of Lawrence of Arabia kind of a thing, and desert. This has become Arab world. But fortunately, within every single one of you's active memory, you remember Tahrir Square. So what happened to Tahrir Square? It was in Moon or it was in Cairo? So when I say that there are social, historical, actual, factual, phenomenological events that have happened in the Arab world that have nothing to do with Sunni Shi, if I have nothing to do with uh, when you have eyewitness accounts of people in a so-called veil that they would be arrested in Paris because of way, uh, one particular mode of clothes, they were reading the revolution in Tahrir Square, standing up and delivering a uh, revolutionary uh, thing, like Tawakul Karaman, the most famous of them is the Yemeni's revolutionary. So that's one event that had nothing to do with Sunni Shi, 2011. Cut two years before that, 2009. What was important in 2009? Perhaps the most massive social uprising in the aftermath of the Iranian revolution of 1977-79, in the aftermath of the presidential, uh, what should we call it, uh, contesting the result of the uh, election, affectionately known as the Green Movement. What was the slogan of the Green Movement? The Green Movement was not to topple the Islamic Republic was not against the Islamic Republic. It was a civil rights movement. What was the slogan of it? Rayaman Kujos, where is my vote? Which is the most inalienable right of a citizen to ask, where is my vote? A fundamental question mark that any state apparatus, if it has a claim to legitimacy, has to answer. Here is your vote. We will count it again. Let's do another election. But it has nothing to do. Now, the fact that 
discredited, discredited elements within the expat opposition, quote unquote, and American newcons, etc., they began to take advantage of this green movement for their own reasons, for their own regime change uh, apparatus. The new conservative uh, movement, the Zionist lobby, etc., etc., has nothing to do with the reality of the green movement. Who was the leader of the green movement? Mir Hussein Musavi. Who was the Mir Hussein Musavi? Was he an agent coming from Israel or from the United States? He was the <coughs> prime minister under the founder of Islamic Republic, the most widely loved and respected leader of, within the Islamic Republic. His wife, Zahra Nahrabar, Karrubi, etc. So, 2009, you look at the Iranian society, 80 million plus population, perhaps the most sophisticated, complicated, uh, driven uh, uh, society in the region, they wanted a fundamental change in terms of their civil liberties, autonomous and independent labor unions, autonomous and independent women's rights organization, campaign of one million signature, for example, was an entirely grassroots women's rights movement initiated by Iranian women within Iran, had nothing to do with anything else. Again, footnote, there are any number of forces in the US or anywhere else that want to take advantage of that, but that has nothing to do with the authenticity, veracity, and nobility of the movement itself, which is not a sudden. Iranian women have been campaigning in the, in the Iranian parliament, for example, for custody rights. For example, for the right of children to citizenship when they are born to uh, mixed marriages because of the Afghan refugees and there were many uh, mixed marriages. Again, you go back to 2009. Look at your, right now you can actually Google it. You will see masses of calm, peaceful, non-violent demonstrations by Iranians demanding nothing more than their civil liberties. Cut eight years la uh, later, or four years later, after Ahmadinejad's uh, second term, the same people went back to poll, elected the best that was possible to them, namely uh, Mr. Rouhani, and Mr. Rouhani proceeded to sign the nuclear deal with the United States and his prime minister, his prime minister uh, Jawad Zai, that stopped, the, potentially, hopefully, stopped the sanctions lift the, uh, the, the, the threat of war and open Iranian societies to interaction with the globe. What part of that has to do with Sunni or Shi'i? Nothing. Zero. And there are no movements more significant, more grassroots, more fundamental, more enduring to the fabric, social, intellectual, moral, imaginative fabric of these societies than the Arab revolutions and the Green Movement. In order to understand them, you have to understand the demographic disposition of 80% of the population under the age of 40. They are economically, uh, cyberspace, etc., connected to the world at large. They want to be part of the uh, uh, world at large. In fact, one of my principal arguments in both my books on the Green Movement and the uh, Arab Spring was that the age of ideological convictions, we have had three ideological formations. Islamism, anti-colonial nationalism, and third world socialism. These ideologies, as post-colonial ideologies, in fact exhausted their possibilities. They were not appealing to the younger generation. The younger generation was no longer ideological. They were rooted in this world. They were a product of post-revolutionary period. The uh, uh, Green Movement began in Iran in June 2009. In July 2009, I was in various tele television programs, wrote a piece for CNN in which I said, this is July 2009. If I were anybody in a position of authority anywhere in the Arab world, I would watch carefully what is happening in Iran. Why? Because the demographic composition of the Arab world is almost identical with the de demographic co composition of Iran. And what is happening in Iran will happen in the Arab world. This is July 2009, before uh, Bouazizi had set himself in fire.
before uh, Bin Ali, Zain al-Abidin Bin Ali left, before the Arab uh, Spring uh, began, not because I'm such a genius, but demography. Demography is very important. Population is very important. Two dates. Why I'm, I'm, I'm offering you? I'm offering you factual evidence with historical experience that have nothing to do with Sunni Shi uh, differences. 2011-2009. 2003. What is the significance of 2003? US-led invasion of Iraq. Fabricated, predicated on entirely bogus reasons. Saddam Hussein was not God's gift to humanity. He was a horrid man. But he didn't have weapons of mass destruction. He had nothing to do with the events of 9-11. Nothing. But the gung-ho diplomacy of George W. Bush is, uh, smoke him out. First, uh, Hans Blix went and dismantled the defense mechanism of a sovereign nation state. And then Americans began to bomb the shock and awe. Why shock and awe? By virtue of what? They used and abused the UN on false predict, uh, uh, premises to dismantle a sovereign nation state. Think about population of Iraq. Think about a society that Sunnis, Shis, but Sunni Shis, Kurds, Yazidis, whatever you have, they also have not only thousands of years of, of, of uh, proud history, Iraq is where the alphabet of humanity is started. Is the fertile uh, birthplace of civilization. If we, when you write, when we calculate, is all in Iraq. Not since the destruction of Baghdad in 1258 by Holagu, by the Mongol invasion, we have had such barbarity of the US-led invasion. And then with, with what, what despicable vulgarity they came and said, shock and awe. Why shock and awe? By what authority? dismantled Iraq, the process of the... And then they send Noah Feldman to write the constitution for, for Iraq. Iraqis don't have any constitutional lawyers. They don't know about their civil liberties. I mean, think of the horror. Imagine if somebody came to Austria and did that, dismantled your country, and then sent, sent some moron law, law student from New York University to write a constitution for you. What sort of insanity is this? The process of debasification, the dismantling of the Iraqi army. Again, none of this is defense of Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein, and the Ba'ath Party was, uh, was a uh, manifestation of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, social contract. No. But two horrible things happened. The process of debasification created a military elite that was robbed of dignity, salary, what will happen to their family, which is now a component of Daesh, which is now the military mind behind the conquest of this monstrosity, uh, Frankenstein creation of, of Daesh. Second, because of the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq, Iraqis as, as human beings, as citizens of a proud nation, were denied the possibility of joining the Arab Revolution in 2011. For them to dismantle the foundation of tyranny or challenge the foundation of tyranny in their own country, in terms domestic to their uh, uh, cultural history. It is impossible to imagine the horror of that year 2003 and the vulgarity with which the US-led invasion of Iraq happened with massive consequences today and today senator clinton says yes sorry i shouldn't have supported that and that's the end of this the fact is that from president bush to vice president cheney to uh, the whole cabinet uh, uh, i so detest their names i repress their names you know them all they are war criminals they have to be taken to international court of justice and held accountable for war crimes. So uh, you cannot dismantle, you cannot dismiss what has happened in the history of this country or any country like it 
by saying that, oh yes, there were Sunnis and Shi'is. I remember, I remember vividly a reporter had called me soon after a bomb blew up in Qazimain in Iraq. And for the first time, George W. Bush had heard of the word Shia and discovered Shia. So the reporter from somewhere in the U.S. asked me, so what's with them uh, Sunnis and Shi'is? I mean, the way that he pronounced Sunni and Shi'is. I said, what? So why are they at each other's throat? I said, listen, man. The expression, the expression shock and awe, is that Arabic? Is that Persian? When you unleash so much violence, shock and awe, as a doctrine of what you did to Iraq, like a, it boomerangs, it comes back. And you see the militarization of American police in Ferguson. It's not, it's not, you cannot just boomerang so much violence and hatred towards a, a country and then say, oh, no, they are Sunnis and Shias. You cannot divorce history. You cannot create an abstraction and say, oh, the Sunnis and Shias, and then shove a microphone in a, in a Muslim face. Are you a Sunni or Shi? Well, I don't know. It depends if I had breakfast or didn't have breakfast. Before that is, of course, the, uh, the horrid events of 2001, the events of 9-11 in U US, in New York, in uh, uh, Washington. As a New Yorker, I can only tell you the horror of that Tuesday and what New York went through uh, as a traumatic event, a horrible terroristic activities, destroying two magnificent, beautiful uh, buildings. Uh, and as I said, on the morning of the Wednesday, the world has legitimate anger against the United States, and they have put it into illegitimate manifestation. As a, a staunch militant pacifist, I'm a paradox, I'm a militant pacifist. I denounce all acts of violence, including that horrid act of violence. I never forget the following Wednesday when I went to teach, I, uh, in that semester I was teaching on a Wednesday, our students on, on campus of Columbia University so traumatized, so frightened, that they were given crayons. These are 18, 19, 20, 21 year old uh, young men and women to draw on our steps to express their anxieties and fears. It was an exceptionally traumatizing event. And then to what end? So, whatever denunciation, legitimate, principled uh, denunciation of American imperialism we have and we should, it doesn't amount to any sympathy, wishy-washy, kind of, no, well, 9-11 was kind of okay. No, it's not okay. It was a horrible event. should never have happened. But what happens after that? What happens after that is the beginning of this bizarre thing called war on terror. War on terror. What is war on terror? As, uh, again, the guy who became the head of the World Bank later, uh, what's his name? Wolfowitz, thank you, said, we are going to end states. Ending states. What state? Ending states in, in plural, plural and generic. Ending states. Which state are you going to end? Just Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran or what? And by what authority? Events of 9-11 were criminal acts. In that criminal act. And if you found places, training spots in Afghanistan, etc., you go and destroy them. Now, the minute we talk about the events of 9-11, then, because I want to conclude this section, I cut back to the Iranian Revolution of 1977-1979, which in my judgment is the, the threshold of what has happened over the last 35 years plus. The Iranian Revolution of 1970-79 was, in my opinion, the most magnificent, pluralistic, multifaceted, last grand revolution of the 20th century. You had socialists, you had nationalists, and you had Islamists. You can begin the story of the Iranian Revolution either from the military coup of 1953 under the, the uh, CIA coup against Mossadegh, 
which is the threshold of Iranian anti-colonial nationalism, and tell the story from that period with perfect narrative legitimacy, 1953. You can begin the story of Iranian revolution from the June 1963 uprising of Ayatollah Khomeini for the first time against uh, the Shah's regime, and give it perfectly legitimate Islamist narrative. Or you can begin with the Siah Kal uprising of 1970 by a group of urban guerrilla Marxist organization and give it a perfectly legitimate Marxist-Leninist uh, interpretation. These three events, June, uh, uh, August 1953, CIA coup, anti-colonial nationalism in the figure of Mossadegh, June 1963, uprising of Ayatollah Khomeini in the figure of Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Siakal uprising of 1970 -71, are the three forces, ideological, political forces, that were present in the period of 1977-1979 when the revolution happened. They were all present. The revolution was multifaceted. One of the most significant uh, demonstrations, for example, in March 8th, during the uh, women's, International Women's Day, were by women. For their liberties, for their rights, for their uh, uh, various legitimate causes. Two things happen that they begin to distort that reality. One is the catastrophic uh, U.S. hostage crisis, 1978, and June, uh, January 19th, 1981. For 440 days, the American hostages were taken, the American embassy was, uh, was occupied. Uh, what happens during these uh, 440 days? The, the entire world attention is distracted to this uh, atrocity by the so-called students follower of the line of Imam, while the faction of Ayatollah Khomeini begins to monopolize the revolution. Parliamentary elections, presidential elections, uh, the referendum to whether you want Islamic Republic or not, they all happen in as a younger student, I was in Tehran six months after the revolution. The revolution happened in February. I was, I was there in June, July, and August. It was the most magnificent streak of freedom. Everybody was there. People were, and the draft of the constitution was introduced, and there was no mention of the Layat e Farid, the absolutist authority of the Jewish Council. It was not there. People were talking item by item, various. Uh, 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 articles of the draft constitution. It is in the aftermath of that flamboyant, magnificent, liberal, open-minded, contested period in Tehran University and other places that people were actually debating the terms of the constitution that Khomeini issued a statement that no, quote, no intoxicated intellectual is going to write our constitution. And began to introduce the element of Elayat al Farid, reneged on his promise for a constitutional assembly, ordered the formation of an assembly of, uh, of uh, uh, religious authorities, which was contested and, and debated by many Iranians, and as this was happening, in November, the hostages are taken. And as soon as the hostages are taken, the battle now is with the great Satan. And all domestic opposition for 444 days is systematically pacified. The hostage crisis ends in January 1981. By September 1980, Saddam Hussein had invaded Iran. Now, who prompted Saddam Hussein to invade Iran? The United States. Why did they prompt Saddam Hussein to invade Iran? Because the Iranian revolution, in its multifaceted cosmopolitan disposition, was widely popular in the region. It had huge implications for the entirety of the Arab world, in North Africa, and so forth. So by propping up Saddam Hussein, they created a bumper zone in front of the spread and appeal of Iranian revolution towards the, towards the Arab world. What was the term with which Saddam Hussein was invading Iran? 
The second Qadisiyya. What is Qadisiyya? Qadisiyya is a famous battle in the year 680 when, uh, when the uh, Arab army invaded the Sasanids. Back in 680. You see, Iranians have a very weird notion of history. They talk about Battle of Qadisiyya as it happened the day before yesterday. <laughs> oh yeah, but, uh, so Battle of Qadisiyya and then the Mongol invasion. Oh, before that we had Alexander uh, invading. So we have Alexander, then the, the Qadisiyya, then the Mongols came, and then of course the coup of 1953. This is the way the Iranian sort of, of uh, is, they're exactly the opposite of Americans. Americans yesterday is old, they have no, they don't remember anything. But in the mind of Iran, it's just too much, and then it's knee-jerk reaction. You hear Bishash uh, Murda, the day of the coup of 1953, the older reaction, the American CIA, the American CIA. Uh, so. Saddam Hussein is waging a war, invading uh, Iran, in terms of what? Persian Arab. So Saddam Hussein ethnicizes the Iranian revolution. That this is an ethnic uh, revolution. You're looking at me weirdly. Am, am I taking too long? Uh, I think you, you, you wanted to start with your second uh, <laughs> section. Sorry <laughs> to interrupt you, but okay. yes. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come I think you wanted to. But don't steal my thunder. Yes, indeed. I'm very sorry. Uh, to, to, no, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Helmut. To make a long story short, the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War of, of, uh, of 1980 is a systematic transformation of a cosmopolitan, multifaceted, pluralistic revolution into a Persian revolution against the Arab interest. So it ethnicizes it. Soon after that, we, on the other side of Iran, we have the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, right? And we have uh, the formation of Taliban, which at the time, Ronald Reagan called them the functional equivalent of the founding fathers of the United States. Quote, I just quoted, right? And by creating the Wahhabi-inspired Taliban in uh, uh, Afghanistan for two functions, kicking the Soviets out and creating a bumper in front of the Iran, spread uh, an appeal of Iranian revolution into Central Asia, they suddenly turned to the same revolution into a Shia revolution because they had created a Sunni bumper zone in front of it. Do you follow? You cannot bracket the, uh, Saddam Hussein invading and calling it, this is a second uh, Qadisiyya, thus ethnicizing it, creating Persian. Iranians didn't think of themselves Persian. Are you kidding me? Iranian students here in Europe, generations, 1950s, 1960s, they were part of every progressive movement. Anywhere around the globe, anti-Vietnam uh, uh, War, anti, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in support of the civil rights movement in the United States. No magnificent revolutionary movement existed anywhere in the world that Iranian students were, I mean, I have published two books on these posters. The, the, the evidence of them are, are there. What Persian? I have posters of progressive Iranian revolutionaries in collaboration with, uh, with Arabs and, uh, and Turks and so forth, in which the poster says Ar uh, uh, Khalij Arab, the, the Arab Gulf. You know right now the fight is a Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf? It's actually American Gulf. Uh, they didn't have any objection to uh, uh, you know, to calling it, if it is for the cause of solidarity, for what they wanted. That is the spirit that came into, uh, into the Iranian revolution. So, I will now move to the second part. The, the first, by first part, the conclusion of my first part is that we need to place the current rivalry between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran into the context of immediate social and political history of the region, that there is no sign of anything uh, Sunni or Shi'i. And when, when I said that, it is not to say that Sunnis are not Sunnis. Of course Sunnis are Sunni, or the Shi'is are not Shi'is. But there are shared experiences, collective memories that nations have by virtue of, again, always think of, uh, do you Austrians get it in the morning and you think, am I a Catholic or a Protestant? And what do I have for breakfast now? Of course, you're Catholic, you're Protestant, you're secular, you're atheist, you're agnostics, whatever it is, is part of you. But it creates a gestalt disposition in you from which you decide various things that you decide. 
probably, hopefully, if you fall in love with somebody and marry them, you don't first ask them, are you a Catholic or a Protestant, before you start dating them. Men or women. The same is in Iran. I'll show you, or anywhere in the world. I'll show you an evidence of it later. Now, let me now cut to the chase. How much time do I have? Um, I would say... Because I have you as a sort of Damocles hanging Yes, over indeed. Uh, about 15 to 20 minutes left. I divide it into two 10 minutes. Uh, what, I want, uh, what, what I would like to do is to give you a quick panoramic view of somewhere in medieval history that Islamic civilization at its height in Baghdad, in Isfahan, in Lucknow, in Cairo, and the effervescence of, in, of intellectual history, social institutions and intellectual histories, that are formed along entirely different parameters. The first, or among the first parameters, is the formation of Islamic law. Islamic law, based on the Quranic verses, Hadith literature, and two other juridical dispositions. One is called uh, uh, Ra'i, the juridical opinion. One is called Ijma, or consensus. We have the eventual formation of Islamic law, initially along cities, so Mecca had one school of law, Medina had one school of law, but eventually we have the four prominent legal theories, Imam ibn Hammal, uh, uh, al-Hanafi, etc., that they theorize Islamic law into four major schools of law that now we have. But all of this is what I call nomocentric. It's predicated on the Quranic phrase, Allahu ala kulli shay'in qadir, God can do everything. So Islamic law has to do, is nomocentric. So what do I do? Okay, you get up in the morning and this is how you pray. This is how you divide your inheritance. This is the rules and regulations governing your relationship with God, with humanity, with your parents, with your children. It's regulatory. But that's not the only component. As the, the, the nomocentric component of Islam is being formed, immediately in interaction with Greek philosophy in particular, initially through Syriac and Aramaic translations, we are in the shadow of great Hamar Prokshtal, the great uh, Islamic scholar from, from your country. Much of this we know because of his scholarship. We have the rise of what we call Islamic philosophy. But Muslim philosophers didn't think of themselves as Muslim philosophers. They thought of themselves as philosophers. As I always say, it's only in Vienna that you have Chinese food. In China, people don't have Chinese food. <laughs> they just have food. <laughs> right? It is only in Vienna that you say, oh, tonight we're going to have Mexican. In Mexico, people don't eat Mexican food. They just eat food. So here, in one particular universality, you provincialize other cultures that have their own universe. You follow? Today, tonight, we're going to Arab, hummus, and the Well. You know, you see, you see the point. So, philosophy, Avicenna, Averroes, Alkendi, etc., etc. They didn't think, oh, I'm a Muslim philosopher. No, Avicenna thought he was better than Aristotle, that he did things that Aristotle couldn't do. So there is a continuity of the formation of what I call logos and three logos, reason. And philosophers and jurists were always at each other's throat. They didn't agree with each other. They thought they were all out to lunch. Philosophers and jurists. And as philosophers and jurists are debating and contesting each other, suddenly you have the rise of the magnificent uh, Irfan or mysticism or, or Sufism, which is an entirely different, is anthropocentric. It transforms that fear of God into the love of God. And it is not accidental. When you read Tarjuman al Ashwab of Ibn Arabi, or Futuhat al Makiya of uh, Ibn Arabi, or Fusus al Hakam, he has a universe. And that universe is comprehensive. That universe has claim on reality. They, Ibn Arabi thinks philosophers are, are out to lunch. So are the jurists, because he creates his own world. You cannot say, oh no, as, as many did in Cairo, burning Futuhat al Makiya, oh no, Ibn Arabi was not a Muslim. How, how could he not be a Muslim? Rumi, another monumental figure. Can you say that Rumi is not a Muslim? 
But his universe is different. He, he said, the leg of the philosophers is really uh, limping. They cannot walk properly. So you have jurists, you have philosophers, and you have mystics. And you have, to cut to the short, uh, Helmut is just giving me the creeps. Uh, you, you have a tapestry of social and intellectual institutions that a Sunni could be, you follow, a philosopher in this particular, and philosophers have a schools. You have peripatetic philosopher, you have Neoplatonic philosopher, you have uh, enlightened Ishraqi uh, 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 philosopher of, of uh, Sohravadi, and there are so many variations that exist in, in social and intellectual history of Islam that you cannot say, are you a Sunni or are you a Shi? Al uh, uh, the famous book of Al Shahristani, Al Milal wa Nahal, Nations and their school of thoughts. It is there, you go, oh yes, there are Sunnis, and there are Shi'is, but there are also Mu'tazila, and then there are the Ash'arite, and there are this and that. You go through them, and you see that there are multiple possibilities, almost infinite possibilities. It's like a grid from which you choose, which or you inherit, or you convert into one idea or another. What happened to that tradition? Cutting to the chase. Colonialism happened to that tradition. Under the onslaught of European colonialism, Muslim intellectuals, more than Orientalists, Muhammad Abdu, Rashid Reza, uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, etc., <coughs> they become instrumental in the radical transformation of this multifaceted magnificent cosmopolitan world into a singular site of ideological resistance to European colonialism. They are more than anybody else responsible. All of these characters, why are they characters? Because suddenly European colonialism is coming and with superior arms, superior e economy, etc., etc., and they think that historically they have lost the game. So they begin to challenge their, their religion, to question their beliefs, and systematically, eventually, redefine it. What in terms? In terms of Islam and the West. So now we have this binary. The West becomes this, and Islam is the other thing. So the West becomes the interlocutor. I have Shakespeare, what do you have? So, okay, now I have Abu Nuwas al Ahwazi. Or I have uh, Al Mutanabi. So I have to, because I begin with Shakespeare, I have to produce something in. But that the fact that Al Mutanabi or Abu Nawaz, they are poets of different social, intellectual comp and literary composition, it doesn't matter. The catalyst becomes this abstraction. I mean, the, the origin of the word the West itself in European history is very new. Plato didn't think. He is the founder of Western philosophy. It is Hegel, with philosophy of history, that he begins to, to create what I call a choo-choo train, his theory of history. Geist begins, oh yes, Indians had thing and Egyptians had a little thing, but it is with them Persians, because it, it, it was the imperial age of the uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, Empire, that the Geist found momentum, comes all the way to Brandenburg Gate, stops, and Hegel becomes the anticipated consequence of Plato. <laughs> and Napoleon becomes the anticipated consequence of Alexander the Great. So he says, I saw history on horseback, you know, his famous uh, uh, statement. This is a Hegelian teleology of history that begins eventually to create the bourgeois conception of the, the West, replacing the concept of Christendom. Before the West, we had Christendom that covered the dynastic histories. Dynastic histories begin give birth to nation states. The category of Christendom gives birth to the West as an abstraction. It is this crucial period, late, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century, that you begin to have the, the construction of Islam and the West, that we have created this mess that we have today distorting both the Mediterranean basis of uh, European civilization, 
the cosmopolitan disposition of Islamic civilization into two abstractions at each other's throat, are you for Islam or are you for the West? Okay? Which now has, we have inherited. To conclude, in five minutes, if we go back to the history that Islam had a world and a worldliness in which philosophers, theologians, mystics, poets, uh, etc., they, they contributed to the manufacturing of that world, creation of that world. Today, when you see Arabs, Muslims, Afghans, uh, Iraqis, etc., coming to Europe, here in your own country, we have two immediate emotional reactions, right? We have the young, open minded, liberal, welcoming, giving them water, giving them baby carriers, breaking their own laws in order to help them come. Entirely emotional reaction. The other emotional reaction, not so noble, actually quite horrid, is by the far right, Islamophobic, etc., etc. Oh, they are going to pollute or uh, untouch us. We, 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 are, we are untouchables. In between these two emotional reactions, there are more principled reactions. What are the principled reactions? Masses of thousands of refugees are coming. I was told today, over the last two days, talking to, to my colleagues, that it takes somewhere between three to five years for them to process their paperwork. What happens to them to the, uh, during these three to five years? I learned the only, among the only works that are possible for them is prostitution. Now ask yourself, is this the way you want to treat your, uh, your uh, guests who are coming? So you need institutions that need to begin to think, learning from the experience of France and crea creation of these uh, sub horrid suburbs, of active, systematic, expedited incorporation of the uh, immigrants into civil society which means housing, which means medical coverage, which means schools for their students, uh, for their kids, which means job training. Yes, this is, I'm sure, costly, but there is a demographic fact. European societies are getting increasingly older. Infant mortality has fallen, life expectancy has increased, the population is aging. They need labor. They need, they need labor, but they don't like the laborer. So, Switzerland likes the labor, but I don't want the menara to go up. Well, Iranian uh, Islamic architecture is creative, the menara goes sideways. <laughs> because you can't stop it, you, it, it will happen. So you need institutions, governmental institutions, civil uh, society, NGOs, to begin active incorporation of the, uh, the, the refugees into society at large. Especially this uh, Syrian wave of immigration, they are skilled laborers. They plan this immigration with extraordinary patience and intelligence. What season to start coming? What navigation route uh, uh, to coming? They are not here for handouts. They are here to make a future. And European history is not alien to refugee history, particularly your own country. You, you know that. So the more quickly they are absorbed, and yes, of course, and they oh, the have a, they have a hijab. So what? What's the difference between a naqab and a black sunglasses that you put on your eye and you think is very sexy? You need to begin to reimagine. And as I said, the drawing back of European history, Europe as an idea, not as a colonial manufacturer, as Franz Fanon said, but actually part and parcel of the Mediterranean civilization. Since Burkhardt, Jakob Burkhardt, reading of uh, Renaissance, Renaissance was pulled north towards North Pole and divorced from its factual evidence in southern, in southern uh, 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 Europe and the navigational routes in the Mediterranean. I'm not saying anything revolutionary and new. Ferdinand Bogudel has been talking about Mediterranean civilization. Americano Castro, the great Spanish uh, uh, scholar, wrote a whole history about the Spanish history, re conceptualizing its Jewish and Islamic uh, uh, heritage. So, from immediate nitty-gritty of incorporating, welcoming, not by, by uh, 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 you know, wishy-washy liberal thing is good to, uh, you're very kind and uh, I feel in a Christian uh, manner I should uh, welcome you. No, 
in, in institutional ways of incorporating this, uh, this ways. The sooner they are legal, the sooner possibility of illegal criminal activities will be uh, addressed. We are in the city of Freud, and I cannot continue, uh, finish without saying that I, uh, some colleagues said, oh yes, they are all young men and full of testosterone. Testosterone, as the great Dr. Freud said, is not just in sex, is also creativity, also ingenuity. So maybe they come up with a software that Volkswagen no longer has to cheat. <laughs> I want to conclude with a number of pictures. This picture is from a Museum of Islamic History in uh, Doha, Qatar, magnificent uh, museum, and you see the names of Allah Muhammad Abu Bakr Omar Osman, which are the names of very sacred to all Muslims, but particularly identified with the Sunnis, immediately laid next to Ali Hassan and Hussein, which are Shi'i icons. They're perfectly happy there. There's no hostility. The next picture, Ali and Hussein. This is where? This is in uh, Sophia Mosque in the uh, in, uh, heart of uh, Ottoman Empire. I know you don't have a good relation memory of Ottoman Empire, but uh, the next one, again, Muhammad and Omar. Again, the same thing within that context. But my absolute favorite, with which I wish to conclude, is this picture. In one minute, why do I absolutely <coughs> adore this picture? You have the mom saying, I'm a Sunni. You have the dad saying, I'm a Shia. And you have the child saying, I'm sushi. OK, first of all, this is the factual demographic evidence of intermarriage that happens between Arabs and Iranians, Afghans and Arabs, Pakistanis and Iranians, you know, factual evidence. Again, as I said, the uh, fight between Arabs and Persians, this is Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf, the reality of the Gulf is that it is composed of not only Persian and Arab traits, but also Indian and African traits. Mm -hmm. But Indians never come and say, oh, this is an Indian uh, Gulf, and Af because they don't have power. They are now slaving away in Qatar and, and other places, particularly from Kerala, from south, south of... Uh, so that's number one, the reality of the fact that a child could have a Sunni father, a Rishi mother, and, and uh, etc. But more importantly, what I like is that sushi is what, uh, what Hegel calls aufgehoben. It's, you know, it sublates. It's no longer, okay, I'm half Sunni, or in the evening I might be Shi, but tomorrow morning maybe I'll be with my mom and I'm more uh, a Sunni. No, it changes the discourse. Mm -hmm. It radically alters the discourse. Suddenly, the fact that this child may love sushi, changes the nature and disposition of our understanding of the Arab world, that these are not Sunnis and Shi'is. They also love sushi. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't see it before. I, I, I didn't see that picture before the last yeah. one. <laughs>